Welcome back, adventurers, to the corner of story and game. Today, we have the pleasure of diving into the world of narrative design and lore creation with the incredibly talented Liv Peelin. As a narrative designer, writer, and lore master for digital games, Liv brings a wealth of experience and creativity to our table. Currently shaping the immersive world of Synced at Next Studios, Liv is known for her ability to craft surreal, interactive experiences that captivate the players. So join us as we explore the art of game design through four more of the lenses. The lens of elemental tetrad, the lens of holographic design, the lens of unification, and the lens of resonance. And together we're going to discover how Liv's world-building prowess shapes the macro view of the gaming universes she works in. Liv, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. You betcha. I am excited. We're going to talk about four of the lenses from the art of game design today. So today we're going to attack the elemental tetrad, the lens of holographic design, the lens of unification, and the lens of resonance. Now I picked these four for you because I know you, like me, are a massive world building and lore nerd. You are a lore keeper, in fact. So, And these four all apply to both micro world building elements and the big macro view and how you can switch back and forth between those two. So this is perfect. This is this I'm really excited. I'm so excited. But before we dig into the lenses, I like to just kind of give everybody a kind of a baseline idea of who Liv Peelin is. I hope I said that right. You got um, it. You did it. You nailed it. I, I screw up last names so bad. Tell us how you fell in love with games. What was your childhood like with digital games, board games, tabletop role playing games, any of the above? And then how did you get into gaming and how you got from the beginning to where you are now? What, what are you up to today? So just take us through your origin story. Origin story. Okay, so I grew up in Queens, New York. I am basically Spider-Man, except as a kid, instead of, you know, wall climbing and web slinging that I so desperately wanted to do, I was limited to running up and down the block with my friends, playing Manhunt, Cops and Robbers, lots and lots and lots of tag and, and bike races. Um, so those were my, like, first games, was very physical, in the space. You can almost call them, like, proto-multiplayer games, which is interesting because that's those are the games that nowadays I gravitate towards. Right. As I got older, though, and I started to realize that digital games were a thing, the first big game I remember playing on anything was Epic Mickey on the Wii. I was obsessed with that game. I was really taken with the double mechanic of paint and thinner, and I just loved how interactive it was. It was the first time I'd ever realized that, like, in a digital space, the player could have an impact on how the world not just like looked, but also ran. And I, for a while, was like just thinning out enemies and I was painting enemies and I would go back over levels and try and figure out like what would happen if I thinned them all or I, I made them all my ally. And it was this really joyous, fun experience. But I got older again and in high school, I found for the first time this sense of Maybe antagonism is the wrong word here, but some deep-seated pushback from some of the guys in my grade and the grades above and below me of like, you can't play games, you're a girl. And I was like, well, watch me. So luckily, not everybody was like that. And somebody that I was friends with at the time in my Latin class like spun around and was like, hey, you love zombies. You love zombies a lot. You should play The Last of Us. And so for Christmas that year, I asked my parents for SLI. My brothers asked my parents for an Xbox. And I very quietly was like, I'll just like save some money and get a PlayStation. Um, and they were great. And we're like, here, we'll just, it'll be, these are the only Christmas gifts that you're getting. Here's an Xbox, here's a PlayStation, go for it, have fun. And then I dumped over 700 hours into Destiny 1. Mm -hmm. I checked the other day. One That's of us. a certain amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> and I played The Last of Us like nonstop. And that was kind of like where I landed with games for a while. I was more focused on writing for fiction and short fiction, longer novellas and novels. Um, and then in like 2019, Russian Doll came out. I don't know if you know that show on Netflix. I do. So it's one of my favorite shows of all time. If you watch it, you like will understand me on a deeper level than I would ever like willingly admit out loud. Okay. But the main character, Nadia, she was a video game programmer and she just owned the, it was a very small part of her overall story. She only like ends up in the office at one point, but it was the first time I was like, oh, oh, I didn't realize that like I could make video games. 
that would be kind of sick. And from there, a couple of years later, as I was graduating college, I was like, wait, hold on. If I could do anything, right? If the world really is as big as people are telling me it is, I think I want to try this. And so a friend of a friend got in touch with another friend of a friend and they recommended that I pick up a programming language if I was serious, as well as take Susan's class. And so I started doing that through a series of very lucky breaks and interesting connections. I landed my first job at Next, where I'm still at. Mm -hmm. Um, And that brings us to here, where I am making games and playing games and getting to interact with really cool people like you and the other folks at the narrative department. Right on. A couple of things. One of all. Destiny One, yay! How early did you jump in on Destiny One? I'm I'm old school. I was there for the the for the alpha and beta, so I, I I'm always curious. Where did you get in on? Oh my god, I'm jealous that you got in on the alpha and beta. I got in when like the game shipped, so it was it like came with the PlayStation that year. It was one of those like you buy a bundle and that's the game that came with it. And I remember very vividly like booting up The Last of Us, and my dad and my brothers were in the room, and they're like four years behind me, so. They were like 11 at the time. They could have, it was okay that they were watching the opening cut scene of The Last of Us. But all the stuff that happens, happens. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll, just, let's just switch games for a second. I'll play this like myself. And I booted up Destiny and I was just like immediately taken with just the entire storyline. I loved the ghosts. I'm a huge ghost fan in general. I very much believe in them and love them to pieces. And so the fact that you just had this little robotic, voice that went looking for you and was like you're here come on let's 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 do stuff i was like oh this is so rad um so yeah i wasn't on the ground floor like you were or even like basement level like you were but i was there from the beginning and my god i'm still there that's got a chokehold on me good that's that's how it should be hopefully it 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 gets through the dark times that it's been through the the light fall as you will but um yeah (laughs) It's it's had bumpy roads. Uh, Destiny One was a, like the gameplay was fantastic, the gun feel was fantastic, the world building's fantastic. The narrative had issues, and when I talked to guys like Joshua Rubin who were there for it, there's reasons for it, and it's nice to see that it's all being fixed and moved forward. So I love I love Destiny. It's probably my favorite like non fantasy world period. So I'm with you. That I was going to say we'll we'll jump in and we'll play. It'll be great. We're we're going to we we have yeah. to. I need to catch up on on power level because I've fallen behind. But yes, sorry. Moving on. Another question I like to ask is: Did you play tabletop role playing games, board games? Did you play any physical space type organized mechanical games when you were a kid? It, I'm just curious if it inf- informed who you became as a designer. So I was thinking about this actually last night, and I realized the answer is no, but. So I didn't play anything with dice and I didn't play anything in like the traditional tabletop setting. However, as I mentioned before with The Last of Us, I'm a huge, huge zombie enthusiast, like have loved zombies since I realized that they were a creature that existed. Yeah. And I have this very vivid memory of being in like fifth or sixth grade and one of my friends at the time leaning over in the middle of like an auditorium assembly that we were bored out of our minds for. And he was like do you want to like make up a zombie story? And I was like, yeah, sure. I don't know what that means, but let's, let's run with it. And for the rest of the year, for the next like four to six months, me and my friends, every second that we had would put our heads together and just like verbally tell the story of like, this is where we'd be. And like, these are the weapons that we'd have. And this is the places that we'd go. And we'd play off of each other and, and improv and go back and forth as to like, let's steal a bus and go over here. Well, if so-and-so's driving, we can't go over there because we have to go stop and pick up supplies down the road. Like it spun out of control and scope so fast, but we had so much fun just living in that world for yeah. ever. And like I said, there was no dice. There were no like, I think mechanics of that kind. Um, but if I had to guess, that's my like proto D and D tabletop RPG situation that I didn't necessarily connect to until very recently. Kids do ideation better than anybody else. Oh my God. Yeah. 100%. So slow, ponderous swarm of zombies or those screaming jump fair, jump scare fast zombies? Definitely the slower ones at first. I think we were, it, 
it being influenced by The Walking Dead at the time because that had okay. just come out. Yeah. But I was obsessed with World War Z. I still am. I like collect copies of that book. Yeah, so it was a scary. Good. Oh, so good. Did you listen to the audio book with all the different actors? I did. That was the first audio book that I ever listened to where I was like, oh, I get it now. I understand why people are so excited about this. Yeah. It was awesome. But yeah, when the movie came out and viewed all this fast zombies, I remember my friends and I being like, this is so stupid. Zombies don't <laughs> run. <laughs> um, and then sure enough, smash cut to The Last of Us a couple of years later. And I was like, wait, okay, maybe there is a place for zombies that aren't the traditional Romero shuffle. Yeah. Um, and they do have some really interesting narrative capabilities. I think we just like missed it as kids. We were like, no, we'll just have big hordes of them and we'll just have to like run from them. It'll be fine. I think you can age a person by just asking them what kind of zombie they first were intru- introduced <laughs> to. Because yeah. you skipped right over 28 days, which are fast, scary zombies. But yeah, yes. you touched back to Romero where, you know, the, that's the evil dead and and Bruce Campbell and all that stuff. That's where I remember zombies from. But yeah, I didn't yeah. even think of like Walking Dead, I guess. I guess I'm getting to be an old. Yeah. <laughs> be an old? An just old. an old. I'm an old. Yeah. Cool. That's we. Okay. We totally wandered off there. <laughs> this is not the zombie episode. That's another time. All right. Later. That's very cool. Let's hit the first lens here. We, the lens of Elemental Tetrad. We did actually talk about this in Susan's Masterclass. So this is the lens where you view a game through four elements, mechanics, story, aesthetics, and technology. So how do you apply or leverage these elements in your role let's start kind of just broad how do you use this lens so it's a really on one hand it seems complicated but it, for me it's pretty straightforward because i'm a narrative designer right everything that i'm doing is in service of the narrative right but that narrative doesn't necessarily mean story it's for me it's in service of the fantasy that the game is trying to push forward so taking it back to zombies for a second Synced, the game that I have been working on. Mm. Um, the idea for Synced is everybody gets a chip in the back of their neck. That chip is recording their every thought, memory, emotion. Um, an update goes live. It kind of corrupts a lot of people's brain matter and puts some gray goo in there instead. And they turn into these zombie like creatures that, you know, hunt and kill and do the good old zombie fashion thing. Um, however, with Synced, the fantasy was you're this one of the sole survivors of this collapse, and you're going to harness this really interesting technology to uncover the secrets behind like the ground zero of this place. Um, and so when you're building the mechanics out of something like that, yeah, okay, you want shoot uh, shooting, right? You might want some melee. Um, but how are you going to fold in the narrative of that fantasy of this like techno apocalypse are the guns all going to be a standard like you rock up to a cabela's and it looks worth for like shot to shot or are there going to be some really interesting modifications that somebody might have made is a prepper turns vendor going to like jerry rig something so that there's some really strong explosions that happen when you fire um so I'm always looking at that in the story or in the narrative through that fantasy sort of situation. Yeah. And then from there, the rest of it kind of shakes in. I always start with mechanics or I try to start with mechanics because for me, at least, that's the difference between games and other forms of media uh, is that that sense of you're in it, you're involved, you're pushing through the world, you're leaving your mark on the world to go back to Epic Mickey earlier. So I start there and I try to figure out what verbs or actions or situations will the player encounter that will give them that fantasy element without necessarily overcrowding the rest of it, right? And so once I have those verbs down, then I can move into the rest of it. I usually jump from mechanics into tech and I leave story and aesthetics for last Mm -hmm. because I need to make sure that the technology will support those mechanics, right? there's a project I'm working on right now, not through next, but for my own volition. And there's two possible ways that I could catch this game, right? It could be either a second person platformer, right? 2D platformer, 
um, or it could be a first person shooter survival situation. The technology that I use to build those games will be very different, right? Like for one, I'm going to need something where I can have a side scroller and really interesting um, mechanics if you're meeting people or interacting with people. Whereas if it's a first person and it's a survival, I might want the camera angles to be different, right? I might want to set it up in Unreal versus Unity, right? right? So I try to nail those two down first and really make sure that it's in service of that broader fantasy. And once I have the fantasy down in terms of feel and experience, then I can really focus in on what I love, which is like story and aesthetics, right? Like narrative designer, love talking about lore, love mastering and keeping the lore, but all of it would be for naught if those two elements weren't locked and loaded. Mm -hmm. And then I can focus on the story and the aesthetics. And from there, for me, at least in my experience, my very limited experience so far, it's quite difficult for me to detangle story and aesthetics because you just have for me at least i have a very cinematic picture of what i want things to look and feel like while you're playing something and in the case of again bringing it back to zombies if i'm making a zombie story i'm thinking i'm gonna lean on a lot of gore a lot of like carcass work right and so do I want it to be a comic book feel where it's all black and white with these really bright flashes of red for blood, right? That's going to look a certain way. That aesthetic is going to feel a certain way. If those zombies are going to be slow moving, am I going to have some really interesting sound design, right? With the way that the player is interacting, are they going to hear things down the hall? Are they not going to hear things until they're up close? Does that inform, again, the story that you're telling? Maybe somebody is hard of hearing, as they're making their way through the apocalypse and that's going to inform a lot of that aesthetic value. So I tend to tackle those last, even though I think as a player, those are the things that I notice first. Right. If only because from there you have a lot more room to play around with what you want things to be. Once your tech and your mechanics are locked and loaded and that fantasy is like ready to go. Right. You got me thinking about a Frank Miller-esque zombie game now where it's all black and white and then flashes of red that'd be fun that would be so sick that would be so sick we should um, make that game let's do it right now um <laughs> you think i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> um but you, you you you're kind of referencing back to the story stack really where every like where the story becomes the most flexible thing but it does bring to mind the question of when you're balancing these four elements and whichever one you start with and however they interplay they've got to pull against each other and push against each other. How do you ensure that they're balanced in a way that's cohesive and still lends to player immersion in a, in a good game while balancing those elements? It's a really good question. So far in my experience, it's kind of a case-by-case basis, but it, it fully depends on the team that you're working with. And what I mean by that is I've been really fortunate to have teams that are really giving and great at knowing how to hit on that fantasy and how to how to center that and build everything else around it so yes like a frank miller game a zombie game would be super sick and if the two of us were working on it i'm sure that the two of us could pretty quickly figure out like a shortcut language of hey i want it to feel like this game i want it to look like this comic and from there you can kind of start to piece things together When I've written stuff for games in the past, I can tell pretty quickly where things are working and where things aren't. I might not necessarily know how to articulate that immediately, but for me to make sure that those elements are balanced and they're bumping up against each other in a way that enhances rather than disparages the overall experience, it is a lot about building up a team that can go, hey, this part really works because I can attach it to this, right? Like this really serves the mechanics. But I don't know that this NPC is going to add anything to the overall story and to put their storyline in, right? To script all of their barks and get all of their resources in, that's going to really harm the amount of time we have to build out the tech for everything else, right? Like that pipeline is going to get shuffled pretty severely. Um, So I try to really keep that in mind and use that as a way to I guess, constrain my creative freedom. Because at the end of the day, right, we're game designers. 
we make really cool things all the time. If, in my opinion, if an idea doesn't work in the game that you're working on, that doesn't make it a bad idea. It just means it doesn't belong there. And so the best thing that I can do is like pocket that thing or like scrap that mission, but know that at some point in the future, I can put that in. And I have the brainstorming kind of already shelled out to then get into that next game's Tetrad and go, all right, let's do it. Yeah. Brilliant. I think I hear the words collaboration and constraints so often that I think I want to change the name of the podcast to collaboration and constraint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we should I, do that. Ella, like, they're, they're so important. They have the power of collaboration so and then what constraints can do to the creative process. So very cool. Taking it wider, stepping back out kind of to the macro view, the next lens, the lens of holographic design. This is when you come at it from the through the lens of looking at the interconnection, how the gameplay elements and the narrative elements, everything works together to create the player experience. So to warm us up here, can you kind of just elaborate on how you do that? How do you approach this? Yeah, so I, I'm going to have to cheat this a little bit with a, with a metaphor. I grew up as an athlete. I was in many sports, and I'm also quite tall. And so there, I have very vivid memories of summer times where I would get in from like playing or, or I'd be out of a basketball game, and my legs would just ache. And I got really good at figuring out like growing pains versus exerted muscles versus an injury, right? And it was a lot of kind of like stepping out of myself almost and really figuring out, okay, so what happened? How am I feeling? How do I recover? I think that same process is applicable to the way I approach games where so much of the interconnectedness of gameplay systems, narrative elements, player experiences... If you're up close, like always, it's right here. It can be very difficult to find the sinew and the tendons and figure out like what isn't working or what needs to be massaged, which is why I think it's really important to always be like a couple of steps back as you're playing something. And that can be hard, right? Like Mm -hmm. I think as players, right? Not game designers, but as players, we know for ourselves what really works, right? I log into Spider-Man the first Spider-Man with Insomniac, and I know that the swinging just feels good, right? Like, there were days where I would do nothing but swing in that game. I wouldn't, I would ignore the cop chases, and I wouldn't go through the missions, and I would just, like, hit one end of Manhattan to the other because it just felt great. Um, And yeah, if I was making that game, I could be like, yeah, this works, we're good now. But how does that swinging element fit into the narrative right and and how does that experience then fit into the gameplay systems at that point not to rehash what i said earlier but it does come back to collaboration right it comes back to that sense of hey guys let's all get in the room let's play this level let's play this quest line what isn't working right what what needs to be poked and prodded and and fixed maybe that first third of what we're working on really lands right the characters are really well developed the dialogue is hitting super well it's just short enough to catch player attention but it's not enough to pull them out and then maybe what happens is like the middle is just a little too long or that level goes on for just a couple steps more than we need right or the players like walking in circles trying to figure out that last puzzle and they don't realize that they have to shine it up on the wall because oh no, we didn't introduce that mechanic earlier, right? We haven't tutorialized that for them. They don't realize that that is something they can do. Um, So it really is this constant dance between being in it, right? And playing that game and building that game and loving it with all that you can. And also stepping back and kind of athlete checking yourself and going, okay, where are the aches and pains? And is this just something that is going to get resolved once like art goes up on the wall and we grow into ourselves a little bit or like, is this an injury that we need to reset? Does play testing play into that at all? Is that something that you can even build slices and have people play test or is like in order to get that sense of what is and is not working or is that still an internal thing in collaboration? That's a really good question. I think play testing does have a lot to do with it because again, like even if you and your team are like, oh yeah, we fixed it all. You put it in front of players that have never touched it before, and you're going to really quickly see that there's stuff wrong. I'm also, I should note, 
I'm coming at this from a perspective of like multiplayer live games, yep, yep, right? Yep. So a lot of that for me has to do with like, does the shooting feel good? Does this like map feel right? Are players going to get lost on it? Are they going to find everything that they need? Hopefully my career is long enough that I do get to work on more narrative driven linear games. And I might have a completely different answer for those, right? Like Full I might go back can. on this podcast and be like, actually I was naive and I didn't know anything. I'm going to take um, on that. <laughs> I would happily be here all day, every day if I could. But yeah, it is, it's a mix of play testing internally with your team and also being able to get enough diverse players in front of you because you also have blind, everyone has blind spots, right? Especially developers for narrative and for gameplay. And if you have players that are like, hey, this isn't accessible or, hey, this doesn't ring true to my experience, that's really important. And you've got to like get in front of that and make those changes as quickly as you can. Yeah. You mentioned gunplay and the, the gun feel that there's a whole art to that. Like when it works, it's <laughs> beautiful. But games where it's not there, you can tell right away. You can like, just feel it. Yeah, it's huge. I'm curious, do you have any, and maybe you don't, do you have any examples from your work thus far, instances or experiences where that application of the holographic design lens led you to something interesting or you discovered something new or just an example of when you had to use it? Um, I have an example, but it's an accident. So I can't really like take full credit for it. When I was first working, like my first couple weeks at OnSynced, um, I was writing a lot of enemy descriptions and I loved it, right? Because I got a real sense of what was going to happen in the game. How are the gameplay elements going to combine with story, right? Like, how are we going to wrap these enemies so that players can like interact with them and not only have this sense of, okay, this is what they feel like to battle, but this is what they mean for the broader narrative. Um, and I wrote this one, I forget the nano that it was for, but I wrote it and I signed off memory fragment found in Gunther's garage in New York. And I put it in the part of my document. I always have a, an area of my documents called the outtakes and remakes. And so if something isn't working in any of my writing, whether it was for like academic fun or work, I would just drop it down there because it felt less harsh than like just deleting it entirely and being like, oh, I really liked that sentence. And my narrative lead happened to like scroll all the way down in my doc and saw that. He was like, hey, do you have a second to talk? And I'm thinking, oh no, I've like already messed up on this job. I've done something wrong. He was like, can you just explain this memory fragment thing? What do you, what does that mean? And I was like, oh, well, you've explained me this, that this ship is recording everything all the time. People's brains get, you know, like replaced by this goo. Surely, maybe some memories are dropping out, right? The same way that like you can have dropped files on USBs or like corrupted files. Maybe people are like accidentally shedding these really emotional moments and they're just ending up around the world. And he was like, that rules. We're going to rock with that. That's really sick. And so these memory fragments ended up being how we wrapped and couched both text and audio but mostly audio files that you would find around the world of synced and it was this really awesome moment of like this is part of the gameplay system right you're walking around you're scanning stuff to pick up information the narrative right you're listening to these stories of the world at large and figuring out like oh so this is what's happening over here this is why this enemy is the way that it is you're listening to somebody turn and it really enhanced the player experience because it was this grounding moment of, oh, yeah, I could believe that if if this is what's going on and this is the techno future that we're sitting in. Sure. Memories did fall out of somebody's head. Um, and I'm really glad that that happened as early in my career as it did, because like I said, it was an accident, but it was a super, super eye opening moment as to how interconnected the gameplay narrative and experience is and how to harness that power in really small ways that don't necessarily like impact your pipeline or touch all these departments and have to have like, you know, beautiful, well-written, but really expensive cinematics. Sometimes just very little lore pieces can connect everything and become nexus points that the players hopefully respond really well to. That's so cool. You call it an accident. But, I mean, it's accidental that he discovered it, but, I mean, you wrote it on purpose. It's something that came out of you. 
I'm curious, this is not lens, this is craft and career stuff, but if Liv today wrote something like that, would you throw it to the bottom of the file or would you pull it out and say, hey, I want to kind of champion this and see where it goes? That's a really good question. I think I'd be a little more confident to bring it up and be like, hey, what about this? I... I think that the value of brainstorming and sharing ideas is huge, especially as a lore master, a lore keeper, because, and this, again, we're getting into career stuff more than the lenses, but I think the games industry is really good and really bad simultaneously at maintain, building and maintaining legacy. And lore keepers, lore masters, lore archivists, lore historians are the people that are helping everybody else build that legacy not just in the moment so that like players feel good about the game that they're playing but let's say somebody works on a project for five years and then gets the chance to work somewhere else right changes studios changes game people are going to have to come up behind you right and they're going to need to understand the world and the game that you've built and so being able to keep records of those brainstorms keep records of those prototypes and have them available makes that next team's job a little bit easier at that at like the very worst but at the best you really are weaving in the dna of your game constantly and you're weaving in the dna of your studio constantly so yeah to go back to the question i think i'd be a little more equipped to be like hey i have this idea do you think it could work right and if not Again, I just continue to slap that back into the outtake section. Mm. But if somebody goes, hey, that actually is really rad. Let's put it in there. They won't need to, you know, scroll through pages of text to be like, this seems cool. Could you explain it to me? I think there's an important lesson there. Maybe don't kill all your darlings. Maybe put some of them to sleep. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Put them in a cryogenic chamber and just let them hang for a little bit. There you go. And somehow you actually queued up a segue to the next lens because when you're talking about big world building and holding it all together, you're actually talking about the lens of unification where you're approaching your game from the viewpoint of how does it all come together. So let's lead this into a question here. How does this lens guide your approach to maintaining consistency and coherence across all the different aspects of a game world from like Laura, as you mentioned, to the characters, to environments, mechanics gameplay gun feel how do how do you how do you use this lens to pull it all together yeah it's it's a really good question i have a background in english lit right so most of my life has been spent reading books poetry short stories scripts plays um And my first two years of university, I was studying like the great Western canon, right? But we were studying it through a lens of political science, philosophy, and English all the time. Because of that, we were constantly looking at the different ways that people consider um, it correct or right to be human, right? If you go the philosophical route... We studied everyone from Plato and Socrates all the way through to like Descartes and Hannah Arendt, right? Books, we studied everything from Gilgamesh to the Odyssey. Um, There was even talks of doing like Lord of the Rings at one point, but that didn't work. And I know I'm talking about books and not games, but with those books, I think it's a lot easier to have the professor stand in front of you and, and talk about a theme, right? And figure out like, what is the theme of Odysseus in the Odyssey, right? It, it's a homecoming. It's returning from war. It's somebody coming back to themselves. It's somebody trying to figure out like how to be part of society again. Taking all of those lessons and applying it to games, I try really hard to pick out the themes of a game as I'm building out the world. And so going back to zombies, because that is just, I can't stop talking about them. Is the theme you're going for decay, right? If if that's the case, then maybe the pieces of lore that you're finding are scraps, right? You don't have whole letters. You're finding fragments and the player has to like put them together. And and that's how you discover like a major plot point. Is the theme community in really challenging times? Because if that's the case, then maybe your mechanics are, it's going to be a co-op, 
there isn't going to be a, a single player campaign. It really is all going to be about you collecting the right people and playing this game together, right? If the theme is actually about transformation, maybe the zombies are turning human again and people have a lot of feelings about what that would mean. So is that going to show up in the environments, right? Are, are places that were reclaimed by nature being claimed by man again? And what, what does that look like? Are we building tree houses now instead of just leaving stuff on the ground? So I try to approach it from that standpoint where I have like almost a, um, a word association map, <laughs> if that makes sense, yeah, yeah. of that theme in the middle. And you just start to pick off all these different lanes and then figure out what works and what doesn't. And I mean, I'm sitting here chatting with you and I'm like, yeah, all this makes sense. Then you could go, going back to the Tetrad, I could go start to build out the mechanics and the tech and realize that like, it's a really good idea in theory. It would make a really good novel. It's not going to work in a game. Um, So you just have to constantly be reshuffling the deck. But that's my long way of saying theme is the way to go. I like it. And you're right. Not every story belongs in every medium. There are... There are narratives or experiences that need to be shared through poetry or through a song or through yes. a, a play or through a game. Like So just because it doesn't belong here, it might belong somewhere else. Exactly. And now that you've said it, I want to, I want to build a Destiny first-person shooter, Frank Miller-esque zombie game that explores the theme of community versus decay and what it means to bring humanity back from zombies. Oh my god, it would be so cool. It sounds like such a good time. Right. Please, somebody, somebody give us the money. Sign us up. <laughs> All right. So taking a lens of unification, I I'm curious about your experience with this lens. How have you ever had an instance where you've needed to reconcile the creative freedom and, and innovation and pushing the boundaries versus, like you said, the overarching, you know, mechanics won't let you do this or you got to consider something else. Have you ever had an instance where something like that has happened because you've been a big picture? Um, Yes. And again, it was one of those early synced learning moments for me. We were pitching ideas. And one of the ideas that I had was like, there's a certain type of nano, an enemy in the game called an eroder. And they kind of have these like big psychic attacks where a beam will kind of come out of nowhere and, and do some serious damage. And I was like, oh, it would be kind of interesting if like, of all places in Canada, Al- Alberta, I think is actually where I pitched it. I was like, what if this eroder has one of these attacks, doesn't hurt anyone, manages to slice through some of the earth and this beautiful, mostly complete, if not fully complete, a dinosaur skeleton appears, Right. How do these people react, right? This this awful thing has happened. The world is, it'll never go back to the way that it was. People are grieving that. But there's this beautiful discovery that happens. And the archaeologists like pen this note of like, we kind of have to credit this eroder. We don't want to. That doesn't feel great. Yeah. But we got to tip our hat where we can and look at this beautiful thing. And I pitched it and everybody on the team was like, this is really rad, but we can't do it right now and I was like why well, I just we just have to write like 500 words it's not we're in and out and my boss was like Liv if we write that there's a dinosaur skeleton somewhere players are going to want to find it and we have to get art involved and we have to get level design involved and we'd have to build out this level and I didn't have the sense of like oh man I was like oh oh wait that's really cool that's a that, that's an option we could have done that. And so obviously that that story didn't end up making it into Sanks. But again, it was one of those things I was like, all right, so it doesn't make it here, but maybe in this Frank Miller zombie thing, it does. And there you go. how cool would that be, right? Like, at least now this idea is out there floating around and I'm aware of it, which is way better than not being, being locked in the back of my brain. So yeah, as much as I would have loved the creative freedom and the joy of working with all these departments and building this like, super beautiful, elaborate dinosaur level. Um, It wasn't going to serve the game at large, right? And there were other more meaningful, cost-effective ways to tell a story of survivors who have these moments of joy and resonance in the midst of an incredible grief-stricken world that, you know, didn't cost a lot. 
It would have been cool to play through a level in Drumheller, Alberta, though. Right? Yeah. Right? We'll make it. We'll get it. We'll, we've got this. I am curious. You know, like totally spinning off for a second here. What is the theme of Synced? I mean, I have my own theories because I've played it enough, but. It's a good you... question. My, I think the theme that I settled on is um, horrors and wonders. There was a quote that I came across when I was in college that was like, enough about the horrors. What about the wonders? Right. And it really stuck with me because, I mean, for a very long time, I was a person. Once more, I love zombies. And part of the reason why I love zombies is like, it kind of showed me from a young age that these people could go through an incredible event where things will never go back to the way they were. And you're like confronted with your mortality all of the time. And yet you can still have incredibly meaningful relationships with people, right? You can still travel and end up in in beautiful environments that you may otherwise never have, have been in. You can still learn and grow as a person and come out of the other side of this awful, horrific event and, and be whole and yourself. And you're never going to get away from the grief of the person that you could have been had this event not happened, but you're still alive and you're still working your way through it. So that was how I focused on Saint, right? That was one of the big themes that I was running with. And then the other theme that, again, I, I kind of focused in on was human nature versus technology and the ways in which we we not only manipulate tech, but can get manipulated by tech. There's a story that I wrote that I loved about this guy who is in this sleep study. And it was an audio log where he was like, the sleep study's bogus. Like, this guy's dreaming about giving presentations in high school in his underwear. This woman is always late for work. And I'm dreaming of murder. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I'm dreaming anymore. But nobody's telling me if it if it is or it isn't. And it was just this little pocket of the world that didn't go anywhere, right? It didn't have any bearing on the rest of the narrative. But it was this interesting thing for me of like, what would happen if we did have control over the stuff that people are unconsciously or subconsciously thinking about? What are the ways that we would tap into it that wouldn't be so great? But again, what about the wonders, right? What are the moments where like somebody can get on a beautiful motorcycle that's in pristine condition and just right off into the sunset and go, hey, if this is as good as my life gets right now, at least I've got a sick ride and the wind in my face. Can't complain. Wow. That is so cool. (laughs) Playing playing Saint and getting to know you, there's a lot of there's a lot of live in there, like when you get into reading the lore and the and the bits and the stuff. So it's it's really cool, but I cannot wait to see someday when you're lead on something, I want to see what that is. Because that's gonna be so cool. I think that would be really cool. I think we have a lot of the same aesthetic and and uh, interests, so I, I think the game you make is something I'm going to want to play. So, just do what you say. I'll just do it, and you know what? I'll uh, I'll make you be the play test from the beginning. I'll be like, guys, don't worry, we've got someone. Without <laughs> Gerald, I'm just there. Pull you in. I'll do it for free. Um, <laughs> we'll pay you. We'll put you in the game. We'll give you an NPC. You'll be there. We'll negotiate later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> The last lens, the lens of resonance. So how do you ensure that stories and the lore and the worlds that you create in some way may create resonance with the players, like on a, on an emotional level, how do you foster that sense of connection and immersion that we all love so much? It's a really, really good question. And it's one that I think about like a lot consciously and unconsciously. Again, part of it is me pulling on my background in English lit and the types of media that I love to consume. I saw somewhere that like no medium does loneliness the way that theater does, right? There's a really specific experience that happens when you're watching Hamlet do his monologue and he turns to the audience and he's pleading, but you can't do anything, right? You just, you have to let the tragedy unfold. You can't stop it. It's It's been in motion since Shakespeare penned it, right? But with games, you can manipulate that a little bit, right? You're, if if writing, what did Joan Didion say? I think Joan Didion was like, if writing is a hostile act because you're forcing someone to see your point of view, video games are the ultimate hostile act because you're 
forcing the player into situations that they yeah they have some control over but there's an ultimate ending that they're they're going towards and even the most non-linear game in the world like it's still going to end eventually so for me when i'm trying to create resonance i'm leaning pretty heavily on um maybe not necessarily tragedy because i friggin love comedy and i try to write as much funny or quips and barks into what i can write but i try to look at what resonates for me and create that space for players one of my like big dream projects someday is i want to make a game of the odyssey where at first it seems like you're playing as odysseus until he breaks the fourth wall and he pleads to you the player and you realize that you're athena and you're controlling him and depending on what voice he listens to, if he listens to you or he listens to Penelope, he ends up more human than Revenant or vice versa by the end. And I think it would be a really interesting experience for a player because it is this hostile act, right? You're, you're forcing this man to do all of these tasks when all he wants to do is go home. But you're still playing God, right? And there is this sense of like, well, I know better than you if you went home right away you might not be yourself. And I think that's a really interesting theme to explore in regards to some of the ways that, especially in the States, people view community and community care and the sense of like, I know best for everybody, right? I'm going to make this law that's going to have these huge implications for all of these people when really like stuff should be an individual's choice and what happens when you're put in that situation when you're just controlling one person how does that make you feel do you feel good about that are you gonna as the player are you gonna try and make better choices are you gonna really enjoy the fact that you're controlling this like weapon essentially um so yeah i try to to lean into what resonates with me and go for the themes that make me sit and think and again it should be no surprise that i'm always going back to zombies and the undead but a lot of what i tend to consume and tend to think about a lot is that sense of mortality and legacy and like i get to be lucky enough to stand on the shoulders of those that come before me i hope that the games that i play and the games that i make get to show those shoulders and bolster them rather than cut the people behind me down right like What's the use of that when we're like in a broader community with each other? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And you're providing shoulders for the people that come after you. You're building exactly. upon the legacy. And that's that's a fantastic way to look at resonance from a macro, a, a world building a large picture. But I'm curious. I have a personal theory when it comes to creating narratives and experiences that you need to boil down. And I'm sure you've heard me preach about this in class before. The, the importance of identifying an emotional moment, like a singular moment in whether it's a game or a play, a net, whatever it is, and figuring out what emotion am I trying to evoke here very specifically. I'm curious, in your experience, have you ever done this? Have you ever tried to find a way to build a, like, you're trying to do something in a single scene that's going to make the player suddenly just stop and feel a certain way. Have you ever chased that that dragon? And if so techniques tips how the hell do we do it it's a great question i think i've been doing it more than i haven't been because of the type of game synced is so the lore that we've been writing have been these small little pops right like obviously there's overall seasonal storylines and and stuff of that stuff to that extent um but the way i described the stuff i was writing to my friends was i'm basically writing these flash fiction pieces that are light bulb moments, right? These quick, quick emotional hits because that's the way that the memory fragments fall out, right? They're these super emotional situations that everyone goes, oh, okay, like I remember what it would be like to be freaked or excited or happy. Um, and so for me, I try to really focus in on through some coaching by my teammates, but also for myself, what is that moment that would make me as, like if it was me being experiencing this moment what would bring the tears to my eyes what would stop me in my tracks what would make me go oh that's very scary and i'm not 
I hesitate to say I'm bad at it because that's not true, right? Like I have a job, I'm, I'm doing it. I can point to pieces clearly that I'm like, oh, I really liked this and I think I did it well. Um, but I'm still floored by more pieces that aren't mine than mine, if that makes sense. Um, and I guess the the biggest tip that I have that I've been using for myself is to consume media outside of games and find those moments that make you go, oh man. For example, I don't know if you've read the Southern Reach trilogy by Jeff Man- Vandermeer. No. It's one of my favorite series in the world. And there's a moment in the second book, mild spoiler, but I'm not going to go into it too much in case anyone does want to read Control. Um, the main character has just discovered a very scary, threatening thing. And he's trying to get out of the room, right? So already it's a very gamey situation in some ways, right? You can you can see yourself piloting this first person and, and realizing that there's a threat in front of you and you've got to get out. And he goes to put his hand on the wall to steady himself. And his hand goes through the wall and he realizes that the wall is breathing around his hand. And he like blacks out and just runs right like that's where it ends the full body cortisol and then you're somewhere else in the next chapter and i remember reading that a couple years ago and being like i want to chase that so bad however you did that i want to put that in everything i do because it was so visceral over the course of just a page or so and that was just reading it right to to then put that into a game situation and have that very distinct moment of like something is terribly wrong and not only can i see it but i can feel it and i i will never unfeel this again um oh my god like life-changing stuff so cool that's the drug we chase right oh man and again i know it's like and in some ways no surprise that i'm talking about like a a sci-fi horror series as i'm i'm saying this these are these are the experiences that for me i'm like oh that's what i want to evoke but like you said, I could, if I end up on this Frank Miller zombie thing, maybe I'm chasing something else. Who knows? Yeah. I always think of, yeah, if you, you've seen the original Crow with Brandon Lee. Yes. The moment where he walks into the church near the end, heading up to the climax. Yes. Kicks open the doors, the fl- crow flies over his shoulder. There's a, it's perfectly framed, perfectly lit. The look on his face, like it's like everything comes together from the last hour and 20 minutes to this moment. And that moment. Like... It, that's what I chase. Yeah. That's, or, you know what? It's a great chase. The cinematic where Arthas kills his father in Warcraft, Frozen Throne. I think it was Frozen Throne. Anyways, the old Warcraft. Because as a kid playing that, you see Arthas coming in, you know he's become this twisted thing, but you do not expect what's coming next. And then it's like, as a kid seeing that's the first time in a video game you've ever seen a major hero become, like it was It was life altering. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you're sitting there and you're like, oh, that's a thing. Oh, there's a thing. <laughs> yeah. Games can tell something important. It was suddenly life altering. It was, yeah. Ah, Resonance. I love Resonance. So to bring it all home, I picked those four lenses because they can be applied together to world building, building lore, keeping lore. So I guess I'm, I'm curious and I'm I'm throwing this at you without a script. In your In your opinion, how would a world builder bring this together? What does this... Is there a master takeaway here? Oh, man, that's a really good question. You have such good questions. I've said that like six <laughs> times. I feel like a broken record. I guess my master takeaway is to use all of these lenses through the experience of legacy and legacy building, right? Because all of this does go into what what is your game going to look like after the player puts it down? And I'm not talking necessarily in a sense of like, like you can see in the corner over there, all of my boxed games that I've collected over the years, right? Yes, I put them there and that's where they live, but they also live in me, right? To be super cheesy. And as a lore master, as a world builder, we get the distinct privilege that not many other people get being the guardians and the gatekeepers of these worlds. And I don't mean gatekeeper in a bad way, right? Where we think of it in a modern context. If you stay over there, I'm going to be over here. Um, People get to live in your worlds, right? I spend hours a day in video game places. And some of those places feel just as real to me as, as, you know, real life locations. Going back to Spider-Man, 
I can't tell you how many hours I spent in the first 2019 Spider-Man, 2018 Spider-Man. It's actually kind of ridiculous to the point where I went back to New York last year after, you know, not being around for COVID and Insomniac Spider-Man felt more like the right New York than the one I walked into, which is an absurd experience for a New Yorker, right? For me to sit here and tell you that the fictional world feels more real to me than the one that currently exists. That's absurd. That's a big take. I hope no New Yorkers are going to come for me. And if they do, <laughs> enough, I'll square up with you. Um, so when you're building that world, when you're collaborating with these other world builders, because yes, you're you're the one organizing all the documentation, but the level designers have things to say, right? The artists are going to make beautiful, beautiful art, concept and otherwise. The um, game designers are going to have really awesome ideas for mechanics and implementation. The scripters are going to do amazing things. God, the localization folks are going to be able to translate all of that into other languages with like beautiful precision in some ways and have that same meaning with a different like language shuffle. That's all awesome. And if at your core, as you're working day to day, you can remember to like look through the theme and balance the tetrad and find the resonance for people while still maintaining that shuffle of like, I'm in it and I'm I'm in this world actively and I'm stepping back and looking at it from a distance. Just keep thinking about the legacy that you're leaving behind and that your team is leaving behind and setting it up so that the people that walk in after you, both from a developer standpoint and a player standpoint, can feel the love and the care you put into it. Because at the end of the day, we're all human, right? Like everybody's going to make mistakes. There's going to be stuff that you probably write in season one that you might need to retcon a little bit by season 25 if you're lucky enough to get that far. That's just how this works. But if you're actively working together with everyone at every turn to make sure that it's as cohesive and consistent as you possibly can, and you can leave those gaps for you to fill in later, you're in a really good spot and you're going to be okay. Even when, you know, you do get those occasional people on Twitter being like, why did you change this to that? And you can just sit there and be like, it's all right. At least you're paying attention. Like, yeah. thank you for paying attention. That's, that's really awesome of you. Very cool. A sub, almost like a subtopic of this conversation has been legacy and standing on the shoulder. So I, I think a poignant way to bring this to a point, to bring it to the end I interviewed Joshua Rubin, who wrote The Dead Ghosts for De uh, Destiny 1. And now talking to you about what you're doing on Synced, I can very clearly see how you have tapped into the legacy of what he created and his story of building those little pieces of lore through a tool that he used because of what happened there and how he wanted to make sure his story was still there. And now you're, you're doing something similar. And I think because you played that game so much, it just comes through. So... I think there's a theme of legacy here that is beautiful and you're doing a wonderful job. And I fairly certain Joshua would agree with me. Oh, that's very sweet of me to say. I loved, I loved the dead ghosts. They were without a doubt, one of my favorite parts of D1. And it would not be a surprise to me if I went back to my like 23 year old self and sat her down and went, good question. I know you wrote that down, but were you thinking of this? I'm pretty sure that she, if, if, if I showed her this podcast now, she'd be like, wait, I think you're right. Get really excited about that. So thank you. Uh, you did it. I think it's beautiful. That is the end of the hard questions. So, but there is a question that lives at the core of this podcast that I ask everybody. And that question is, in my opinion, there is a magical space at the intersection of corner of story and game, but also improv and screenwriting and all these wonderful creative acts where we can all just get together and hang out and there's a, a shared fellowship that just naturally happens. So if you, if you agree, if you believe this is a thing, in your opinion, what is the magical thread that holds us all together? Oh, man. I honestly think the magical thread is, is the want and desire to experience all the different ways people can be a human being. Um, and I know that that like, can be a very kitschy, Thing to say but I going back to Hamlet right I'm not the son of a dead king I hope 
that I never will be. That is not the legacy or the thing that I want to step into. But I love watching Hamlet be put on. I love experiencing it. I love watching that tragedy. And I know that that's a strange thing to say to love watching a tragedy, but it's really poignant to watch all of these characters struggle with such a monumental shift. And at the end of the day, the world still goes on, right? You get to the end of that play and hardly anybody survives, but the survivors hopefully keep everyone's names in their mouths, right? They continue to tell those stories and, and that story continues to be told. So for me, at least that magical space is just the ability to experience all the different breadths of humanity and, and the ways in which we live and die. Right. But that sense of I'm going to continue to carry these stories, these people, this love with me far after those those authors or writers or screenplays maybe vanish. Um, I'm still in communication and in constant communion, maybe that I'm in communion with these these broader stories and these broader versions of humanity. Um, and I get to have these glimpses of what life could be like had I lived. I, I think back to the overwhelming success of everything, everywhere, all at once. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's one of my favorite movies of all time. I remember sitting in the theater and just like sobbing because I was like, oh my God, I've needed this movie so bad. And here it is right when I needed it most. And this thought that this one woman had all of these other cells and all these other versions of what her life could be like, but this is the one that she's living in. And yet she's still able to tap into and and field all these other skills and experiences. It's part of the reason why I admire you so much, right? All of your, your skills and all of your lived experiences, that's so big and cool and awesome. And you've gotten to be, have such a full life getting to interact with these entertainment forms, this, this transmedia I feel so privileged to be living through the time that I'm living in and have access to comics and books and film and TV and video games. Like that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's such an honor that I can contribute even a little bit to all of that. Right. Just what a joy. Mm. Amen. I'm there with you. Oh, all right. Well, that's the end of the serious ones. Quick fire times. Ooh. I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions, just top of the mind, just to get to know you a little better. What are you playing right now? Uh, I'm once again playing through Alan Wake 2. I think I'm just always playing through Alan Wake 2. Assume that if if you don't hear from me, I'm in front of my PlayStation piloting Saga and Alan. But more seriously, I've just picked up Titanfall 2 for the first time. Oh. I'm having so much fun. The <laughs> gameplay is so rad and the story is moving so quick. Like the pacing is is really engaging, um, so yeah, those are the two that I'm playing. The third like sequel game to round this out, I'm always playing Destiny Two. So it's Alan Wake Two, Titanfall Two, and Destiny Two. I need to start playing more off the cuff original <laughs> games. No more sequels, but games that don't end in, don't end in two. Exactly. Well, we need to fire team sometime and go run something because I need it's to get caught nice. back up. I'll catch you back up. We got this. What are you reading right now? Uh, That's a good question. I am, again, wish I was kidding, wish I was kidding. I am reading The Playful Undead and Video Games, Article Analyses of Zombies and Gameplay. I picked it up at GDC last week. It is a joy, very academic text, but just some like really awesome truth bombs and enlightening little bits of how you can use zombies in video games. Um, So that's by like, work but also selfish pleasure read at the moment i've also just started hyperion by dan simmons uh someone recommended it to me when i was at gdc and so far it's pretty good it's a little bit out of my normal scope and range of of the sci-fi fantasy that i read uh but it's really sick i'm enjoying it nice so somebody sat down and wrote a book just for you zombies video games yeah yeah, we were. Yeah, me, me, and Cam actually were walking around the bookstore, and I was like, "Oh, books, books, books!" Saw Playful and Dead, and went, "Oh, I'm getting this one." And he was like, "That was so fast! Like, there was no hesitation there." And I was like, "No, I, this is coming home with me. It's mine now." 
you and Kim were walking around and you were talking about Alan Wake the whole time. I zombies, man. That's my that's my fail safe. If you want me to stop talking about Remedy and Alan Wake too, you just put nice. just start flashing zombies in front of me, and I'm like, ooh, shiny, <laughs> ooh, slimy. Okay, <laughs> if you were uploaded into a digital game world, like perfectly uploaded, and you had to spend the rest of your existence in that world, this becomes your new reality. What world would it be, and what would your character be? This is such a hard question. Because there's like five or six that are my like off the cuff immediate. This would be cool. Um, I gotta pick one. Man, I'm gonna go with Alan Wake too because of course I am. Of course I am. The runner up is Dredge to be fair because I live in Maine and I'm like off the coast, so I feel like I would just be myself. But in that town, however, if I was perfectly uploaded into Alan Wake two, I could totally totally see myself being one of the folks who works at the nursing home and is like constantly pestering the old gods of Asgard and being like, so can you tell me another tour story? And they'd be like, stop. Like, this is the sixth time you've been in this room today. Like, please, please do anything else. So my entire function would be to annoy Tor and Odin. And I'd have a great, I'd be good at it. I just know I'd be good at it. <laughs> Oh, yay. Last quick fire. If you could host a game session with any four people, living or dead from any time period, who would it be and what would you play? And this could be digital games you can sit around on the couch and play with controllers. It could be a LAN party or it could be a tabletop or a live action, whatever. This is so hard. Um, four people, any game. Immediately, Mary Shelley. Nice. I have, like, worshipped the ground she's been buried in since I was 10 and read Frankenstein for the first time. My One of my best friends, Ivy Sarker, she and I have known each other since we went to Concordia together and she is a constant gaming partner. She's one of the few people that can make me play any game. We played It Takes Two together and although I have many things to say about that game, it was so much fun because I was playing with her. Carrie Fisher... I don't know if she was much of a gamer. I always, as a kid, like thought I'd be able to meet her someday. And obviously like that won't happen. But I just think her sense of humor and her wit would be really fun in a game environment. Yeah. And then Abria Iyengar. She's a GM that has done stuff for Dimension 20. Yeah. And if I could gather those four people... I would love to play a campaign of Starstruck Odyssey, which is another Dimension 20 campaign situation. But I just think it would be really fun to be playing a cyborg in the deep space with all sorts of weird characters and creatures and get to listen to Mary Shelley be like, what if we like Frankenstein up here? Like, what would that look like? I, just, I would have so much fun. It would be a great time. I'd be like, we can do this forever. You guys, you're not dead anymore. Yeah. You you live on with me. So that would be really sick. Very cool. That's a good pick. I like that. Well, that is the questions. And we're going to start heading for the door here. But first, I like to make a little space to talk about what it is you're working on, things that you might want to promote or boost. Obviously, Synced, if anybody's out there and wants to come carry me through, because I love the game, but I suck, please. Let me know. But <laughs> what, are you, what are you working on? What do you want to talk about? Throw something at me. Um, aside from Synced, I've just started, or not just started, it's been happening for a little now, The what I'm calling the Lore Master Monday slash Lore Master Files. And so every Monday I try to get on and on a blog space on my website and also on LinkedIn, I just kind of talk about parts of being a, a lore person in video games. Um, everything from like some common problems that I've run into and like crowdsourcing solutions to even dropping mock-up databases of how you could organize your lore. It's really fun. I'm having a really good time. There's a lot of other lore people that I've met through this endeavor so far who are so knowledgeable and compassionate and brilliant at what they do. Um, and it is a distinct pleasure of mine to be able to like shout about them as well and and see them in the comments so if you've ever had any questions on what being a lore master keeper historian archivist looks like or you straight up like 
would like help organizing your lore for your tabletop games to your actual, you know, big professional situations, come check it out and ask me questions because I love to talk about lore as much as I love to talk about zombies. You know, that's an interesting point because I actually would like to get you to come back in a few months and let's do an episode on lore and lore keeping in all different spaces because I have thoughts about world building and maintaining my, what I call the filing cabinet of death. But yeah, let's do that. <laughs> that's so good. That's that. so good. What a good name. All right. So before we head out the door, because it's time to go, um, I'd like to give you the last word. Do you have any parting words of wisdom or a quip hit me with before you head out the door? Oh, man. I don't think so. I guess my only, my last thoughts are like, one, thank you so much for having me. This has been the highlight of my month easily. You went but to also, see this month. Hang on. I know. Listen, listen. Any time that I get to spend with my friends automatically becomes a highlight. So highlights of GDC for me were hanging out with the T&D folks in person and, and seeing the Alloway talks. Great. But getting to do this and break down with you is like, as of today, the highlight. And then tomorrow it'll even out and we'll be back to like GDC and Gerald side by side. Okay. No Jeez. point differences. But yeah, thank you for having me. And if anyone else is thinking about making that Frank Miller game, hit me and Gerald. We would be good at it. I promise. I could. We'll figure out the credentials, but that would be rad. Well, it sounds like my party needs their healer, so I'm out of here. I'm going to have to kick you out of the door on the way out. But first of all, Liv, thank you for stopping and sharing your insights and wisdom with us today. And to you, dear listener, thank you for taking a seat at the table. Until we meet again, remember, keep exploring, creating, and sharing your stories with the world. Stay safe, Wanderer. Your chair will be ready by the fire the next time you stop in the corner of Story and Game.